And we're back. And we're back in even stricter lockdown. Yep. Yep. So here we are in the same city, but we're not allowed to meet. So luckily we have this uh, virtual place to talk about mm -hmm. astronomy, astrophysics, and cosmology. So this week's topic, Luke, lithium. We know it's an important chemical element. Mm -hmm. Apparently it's going to be very important for batteries of the future, but there's also a cosmological lithium problem. Mm -hmm. Right. So do you want to tell us what this lithium problem is? Well, all right. So first of all, lithium is the third element in the periodic table. So it goes hydrogen with one proton in the nucleus, helium with two protons, and then lithium has three. And after that, most astronomers don't really care what comes next. Uh, so here's what happens. As a cosmologist, we know that the very early universe, in, well, at least in our model, is, is very hot and very dense. And so the earlier you go, the hotter and denser it gets. So at some point, we think, it must have been hot enough and dense enough to make nuclear reactions uh, a reality. Right? So if you smash uh, particles together fast enough, smash atoms together fast enough, eventually you get to energies which are so high that their nuclei get close to each other and actually start to fuse together. Uh, but but j j just that you just run the clock backwards there, right? But so in the life of our universe, it starts in this hot and dense state. And what you're saying is it's getting cooler and less dense as time goes on. Yes, exactly. Okay. So as a cos cosmologist, you've got to sort of learn to hit reverse and play at the, at the right times. Uh, Video so, recorders. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Uh, well, if, if the if the kids don't know what that means these days. So. Our knowledge is today, and then we have to work backwards into the past to work out what happened. But the universe, so we think of it sort of, you know, it hit play and ran forward. So, yes. Um, so that's what we do. At a very, very early times, things are so hot and dense that there's just free protons and neutrons hanging around and electrons. There's no nuclei because there's so much energy in the universe that any nuclei that tried, any proton and neutron that tried to stick together would immediately get blasted apart by all the other stuff hitting it in the universe. And then at about, and the, the timescales here are about one second, which is really nice and convenient <laughs> amount of time, things have cooled off enough that actually those nuclei can start to, to stick together and we can start to get nuclear reactions in the very early universe. Uh, so one of the things that we you do as a cosmologist, uh, which is a standard part of just about every cosmology course and uh, a whole lot of fun, is you go through these nuclear reactions and try to work out what would happen over the in the time period between when nuclei can form and when they're too cold to undergo this fusion to stick them together. And in that open window of about three minutes, um, uh, some interesting stuff can happen. We, we should note at this point, uh, for the non-expert, uh, there is an excellent book on this very topic called The First Three Minutes, yep. written, written by uh, Nobel Prize winner Steven Weinberg, who, who died last weekend. Yes. So, you know, it's a very sad time, but the book is excellent. So I recommend it to anybody who just wants a, a popular account of the very early universe. Yeah, one of the, one of the greats, one a uh, real legend of of a couple of different fields, actually, of cosmology and of, of particle physics. So what the standard calculation tells us when we turn the handle and crank out the numbers is that the universe converts about a quarter of its mass in ordinary particles, the stuff we're made out of, from hydrogen, just protons, into helium. So, the, so there's about 75% of the universe is just free protons, so hydrogen nuclei, and then about about 25% is helium nuclei. And very nicely, that uh, pretty much agrees with the universe as we see around us today, especially if we see a bit of the universe that stars haven't sort of processed and used up and burnt and done their own nuclear reactions to. If we get back to some, some untouched gas out there, we find this 75-25 uh, ratio. But uh, it's actually still true in the sun, right? The sun is basically... Mm. 75% hydrogen, 25% helium. And helium itself was discovered in the light of the sun. It was the mm -hmm. spectrum of the sun that first showed the existence of this element helium. Yep. So that, that bit of the picture works nicely. And then we start to say, okay, what about the other elements? Do we get any of those? And 
the, the first element we look at is one called deuterium, which is just one proton and one neutron stuck together. And we work out how much of that we would expect to find. And we find that that one works out pretty nicely as well. The amount predicted from our calculations and the amount that's actually out there in the universe. I'm just looking at the, the notes from our wonderful book, <laughs> The Cosmic Revolutionary's Handbook, where this is uh, in the chapter, We Are Mostly Made of Stars. Um, uh, the, the, the numbers here are sort of, you know, one part in a hundred thousand. So out there in the universe, if you just pick a random nucleus, you're probably going to get, you know, a, a proton or you're going to get a, a helium four nucleus, I should say, two protons, two neutrons stuck together. But every one in a hundred thousand, you'll pick yourself up a deuterium nucleus. And so that's, that's another tick. So we've got helium four, we get right. Uh, deuterium, we get right. Helium three. We seem to get right as well. So that's two protons, one neutron. It's actually it was one of the sort of slightly surprising things really digging into this for the book. It's actually quite hard to measure that out there in the universe to try and find a pristine bit of the universe where you don't think it's been processed by stars to really get down to the, the amount of helium three left over. But again, the, the prediction and the observations line up pretty nicely for helium three. Okay. So just to add a couple of little bits of historical mm. context, a lot of this stuff was worked out in the 1940s, where, um, of course, there was a, an interest in nuclear physics from not only the cosmological aspect, <laughs> but, of course, nuclear weapons yep. and nuclear power. So this is when people started calculating nuclear reaction rates, and it was people like Alpha, Herman, Gamow, who realized you could apply this to the universe. And we should also note that um, like uh, your PhD area, looking at Lyman alpha clouds, we, mm -hmm. we know people like um, Max Patini at Cambridge. Is your thesis yeah, up there my somewhere? thesis up there, yep. Yeah. And uh, uh, one of our colleagues, people like Ryan Cook, yeah. who go out there hunting for pristine clouds of gas and trying to measure these relative abundances to, to you know, tie down whether or not these theoretical predictions match observations. And as you said, it's hard work, right? How yeah. do you spot helium three out there in the universe? Well, one way, we, we might as well just pop down this little uh, alleyway for a second. The way that they particularly have been doing it is what you would like is a bit of the universe that, as we said, nothing has touched, no stars. But then the problem is, how are we going to see it? If there's no stars in there, how are we going to actually observe it? Because it won't be lit up. And a way you can do it as uh, we explained in a previous video about the Lyman Alpha Forest, is you need something bright behind the cloud you want to see, which can, can shine through it. And we see it sort of in silhouette, like seeing a black cat up against the moon on a, on a dark night. And what you can do with that is, as well as seeing the hydrogen lines, which is what we talked about in a previous video, you can see evidence of these other things, especially deuterium. If you've got good enough observations and enough of them, you can get down to the point where you can measure the amount of deuterium in a cloud of gas that you wouldn't see otherwise. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's actually, it's kind of cool how they can do all of this, right? As you said, measuring the individual abundances is, is hard work, mm. but they agree, yep. except for... Except when we try to do the next one. So the next most abundant element is lithium-7. So three protons, four neutrons. And the calculations we do say that's the next most abundant thing in the universe. And in this case, the, the, the fraction is now one in 10 billion. So if you go around in the early universe grabbing random nuclei, right, you've got to pick up 10 billion of them before you've got a chance of getting one, you know, a better 50-50 chance of getting one lithium-7 uh, uh, nucleus. So that's the prediction. The problem is we then go out into the universe and we try to measure the abundance of lithium and we get the wrong answer by a factor of about three. Now, the important thing when you're comparing theory and observation is that you're not just comparing one number with another number because they'll never be exactly the same and your observation isn't perfectly precise. So what you want is a range of predictions from the theory 
and there'll be a range of predictions there because it'll, it depends on other parameters that you don't know exactly, but you know fairly well. And then there'll be a range from the observations as well. And if those overlap, then you're in business and it's your theory and your or prediction, your predictions and your observations are consistent. And if those don't overlap, if those are quite different, then you've got a problem. Okay, your theory and your predictions don't quite line up with each other. And in the case of the other uh, observations and, and predictions, uh, there's a lovely overlap. Sometimes one's bigger and smaller, sometimes the other way around. With, with lithium-7, there's about a factor of three difference. And we know these numbers precisely enough that there's, there's no overlap between these, these two regions. And that is known as the lithium problem. Okay, so we have a problem and we think we understand nuclear physics enough and the reaction rates that we think the theory is right. Mm -hmm. um, the observations we know are tricky, but we, we know the people that do these observations and we think that they're pretty good sort of um, measures of, of abundances. So mm. what's the possible solutions? I mean, are, are we missing something in our theory or is there just something going on with our observations we can't get a handle on? Well, there's a couple of different theories that we actually discuss this time in the conclusion of the book where we discuss a whole bunch of problems with possible problems with the Big Bang Theory. One of them is, okay, maybe we are missing something with the nuclear physics and that was a live option. And steadily, as we've done more of the experiments and calculations we've needed, to nail down the exact rates of this reaction and that reaction, that window has kind of disappeared. Um, so we think we, we, we do know the nuclear physics well enough for that. It is quite hard, turning to the observations, it's quite a hard measurement to make because um, you can't, th there's not enough of it to go and see it, for example, in those clouds where Max Bettini and Ryan Cook and their collaborators are seeing them from quasars in the early distant universe. So they were pushing to the edge of their data to see a, a type of nucleus like deuterium that was there in one part in 100,000. And now we're, we're, we're trying to find something which is there in one part in 10 billion. So it's the difference between five zeros and 10 zeros. So that's out, that, that we're not gonna see it there. So it's actually quite a hard measurement to find it in the local universe. You can find it in the spectrum of stars, but then by definition, you're, you're seeing it in an environment where um, other nuclear reactions have happened. And so it's quite, it's quite a, a tricky thing to measure. Um, in particular, it seems like lithium is the sort of thing that would be um, used up by stars, but not really created by stars. So if there's some lithium hanging around in the center of the sun, for example, it could undergo a nuclear reaction to turn into something else. But the reaction pathways of all the other stuff that's happening inside the sun won't really create lithium-7. So whatever lithium abundance we find is probably there from the early universe. So we can at least get some sort of limit, but even that hasn't, hasn't helped us out too much. Um, and so some people are looking at the, the possibility that there's some really properly exotic physics going on here that we don't understand. There's, there's some sort of reaction, some particle, some something or other in the early universe uh, that, is, uh, that we didn't know about otherwise which doesn't have a big effect because we at least got those other three predictions right. Uh, but for, for whatever reason, it's, it's there at, at just a level to, to ruin the lithium <laughs> prediction. Yeah, so I mean, that, that's a tricky one, isn't it? I mean, it's a tricky one to throw something in a, into the mix hmm. that only has a subtle effect, right? You, you would think that if you threw something into the mix that would mess up lithium, that it would also impact the other reactions and of course there, there's lots of other reactions going on such that the relative proton to sorry the hydrogen to helium uh deuterium abundances all get screwed up as well at a much larger level than the sort of level that we're seeing with lithium yeah but, but what could it be i mean i mean what kind of ideas people put forward i mean this is this is i said this is where we see um 
fine tuning which makes people uncomfortable right yes where you need to put in a reaction and you've got to twist its properties in such a way that it leaves everything alone but does stuff to lithium yeah so if, for example if there's another type of particle that's hanging around in the early universe which interacts with protons and neutrons rarely but enough right there's that window there of You've got to make sure it makes the same amount of deuterium to one part in 10 to the 5. But then you can mess around with how much lithium to one part in 10 to the 10, right? There's a, there's a gap there of 100,000. So as long as this particle turns up just enough to sort of nudge a bit of lithium around or nudge a proton around when it's just about to hit a lithium, but, but be totally swamped when it comes to deuterium, that would do it. But it is this sort of fine-tuning in the physics sense, not for life, but in the, in the sense that you've got to you've got to take your theory and look at the internal dials and just dial in exactly the right amount of it does this but it doesn't do that and it takes a left turn at albuquerque and just hits the right particles at the right time so it those are being explored and i think it's it's fairly safe to say no particularly nice neat natural solution has has popped its head up uh, for the moment okay so look, let's try and wrap up with, with this this week. So we have a cosmological lithium problem. Mm -hmm. We don't have a solution. And it's still one of those outstanding problems that you know, we are really looking to solve. Yeah, it's one of those problems where it's getting enough of the answer right that we think the, 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 it's, these calculations are getting enough right that we think the answer to the lithium prob uh, problem is hopefully something nearby to where we are at the moment it's just over here it's just over there maybe it's just over there but in the history of science you never know sometimes a little problem turns out to suggest a really big change in our understanding of the universe